Medical authorities often describe wound healing in terms of overlapping phases that occur in the days, weeks, and months following an injury. These phases are hemostasis, inflammation, proliferation, and maturation. Hemostasis is commonly included as a component of the inflammation phase, but since we've examined hemostasis in a separate video, we'll only briefly comment on hemostasis before continuing with the remainder of the inflammation phase. Hemostasis is the body's attempt to quickly stop bleeding without unnecessarily disrupting normal blood flow. In the separate video entitled Hemostasis, we saw the constriction of an injured blood vessel, the formation of a platelet plug, the strengthening of that plug by the addition of fibrin strands, and the body's protective systems preventing excessive clot growth. In this video, we'll look at just one example of a skin injury. But injuries are unique, and the healing process for those injuries varies depending on a number of factors, including the depth, size, type, and location of the wound, the presence and duration of infection, and the health and age of the person injured. So generally speaking, when the skin is injured, for example by a cut or a puncture wound, after the bleeding is stopped, a blood clot is left within the tissue, and a scab will usually form over the wound in the first few days. The beginning of the inflammation phase is marked by the migration of white blood cells into the wound. During the first few days after the injury, the body tries to clean up the wound site. Bacteria, dirt, and damaged cells, as well as other types of debris, may be present in the wound. White blood cells called neutrophils migrate from the bloodstream through the tissue and into the wound. These cells begin to engulf and digest the contaminants. This migration of cells from the bloodstream to the wound begins at the capillaries. Capillaries are the tiny vessels that connect the very small arteries to the very small veins. As the blood passes from the small artery through the capillaries and then into the small vein, oxygen and nutrients are delivered to the tissue, and carbon dioxide and other waste products are absorbed and carried away. The migration of the white blood cells is made possible by the dilation and increased permeability of these capillaries. After the capillaries dilate, circulating white blood cells are able to slip through the vessel wall and make their way to the wound. These dilated vessels cause noticeable symptoms that are traditionally associated with inflammation. The increased permeability of the vessel wall allows a greater amount of the fluid part of blood, the blood plasma, to leak into the surrounding tissue, causing the area around the wound to become swollen. The increased surface area of the dilated vessels results in greater visibility of the red-colored capillaries, giving the skin around the wound a more reddish appearance. Increased surface area also results in greater heat transfer to the surrounding tissue, making the wounded area warm to the touch. After a couple of days, the neutrophils begin to die off. At the same time neutrophils are dying off, a different type of white blood cell called a monocyte migrates from the bloodstream to continue the cleanup process. Monocytes mature into macrophages and not only continue to engulf and digest bacteria and debris, but they also engulf and digest the dead neutrophils. These cells remain in the wound, continuing to engulf and digest cellular debris as the healing process moves forward. The macrophage plays a key role in directing the next phase of wound healing. By releasing various chemicals, the macrophage attracts and stimulates other cell types to accomplish a variety of reconstructive tasks. Within days of the initial injury, the next phase of wound healing begins. This phase is called the proliferation phase or the reconstruction phase. During this phase of healing, the wound is gradually invaded by a tissue called granulation tissue. This type of tissue has a bumpy texture and a distinctive red color similar to the color of raw beef. In order to make room for itself, the granulation tissue secretes chemicals which degrade the existing clot. One very important type of cell in this invading granulation tissue is the fibroblast. 
Fibroblasts produce flexible, tough, fibrous material called collagen that provides strength and structure to hold the wound together. Dense networks of new capillaries are also part of the granulation tissue. These capillaries bring oxygen and nutrients to the many cells involved in the reconstructive work. They also help to absorb and carry away many of the waste products generated as various cells and materials are degraded or digested during the healing process. As granulation tissue makes its way into the wound and an oxygen supply becomes available, cells in the upper layer of the skin, the epidermis, begin to creep across the wound until they come into contact with each other. This provides the wound with a top coat of protective skin cells. Also during this phase, the edges of the wound are gradually pulled together. A significant number of fibroblast cells are transformed into cells that function somewhat like muscle cells. These cells grip the edges of the wound and slowly contract, causing the wound edges to draw together. Older collagen within the wound is continually being degraded so that even greater amounts of new collagen may be deposited in ways that hold the progressively contracting wound together. The final phase of wound healing may last as long as two years. This phase is called the maturation phase or sometimes the remodeling phase. Several weeks after the initial injury as the proliferation phase winds down and the maturation phase begins, cells and capillaries that are no longer needed begin to thin out. During this phase, the repairs that were made during the proliferation phase are made even stronger. The original collagen material is replaced with a different, stronger type of collagen and is arranged in a more favorable pattern, and the wound continues to contract. So toward the end of the maturation phase, the wound is permanently sealed with a collagen-rich scar tissue that has little of the vibrant cell activity present during the proliferative phase. To sum up then, we've examined the phases of wound healing and seen how the wound is cleaned during the inflammation phase, how the clot is replaced with granulation tissue and a new covering of epidermal cells during the proliferation phase, and how the wound is eventually closed and sealed with scar tissue by the end of the maturation phase.